Hi, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. I uh, was given a Bible study by somebody, and I'm going to be mailing this back to them. But I thought it was worthy to share with everybody. And it's about eternal security, the unpardonable sin, and falling away. And they asked me, how does predestination mesh with this? And uh, it's, wow, several pages long and, wow, a whole bunch of scriptures. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm just going to read some Bible scriptures to you, point some things out, and uh, let you think about things. Because, you know, I... I believe those that stay close to the Lord are eternally secure. But I tell you what, there are Bible verses that point to people that could believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are a couple things that the Bible says that uh, they would not go to heaven. I mean, for one thing is uh, committing the unpardonable sin which is attributing the works of Jesus to the devil, and something we haven't seen yet, but the uh, taking of the mark of the beast. Now, there's a guy named John MacArthur, very popular on the television, and he says one a Christian could take the mark of the beast, and they're not going to go to hell because of eternal security, and they also call this once saved, always saved. And I shudder. I, I could never tell somebody that. I just, I just, you know, can't do it. And I'm not saying I have all the answers. I don't. I mean, every time I pick up the Word of God, I, I learn something new. Every time I do a study, I find something new. Every single time. And sometimes I try to go in one direction and end up uh, going another. So, all right, let's read what uh, this one has to say. Eternal security believers say that those who commit the unpardonable sin never really had the Holy Spirit. But the Bible says differently. Definitions from Strong's Concordance. So, let's take a look. Uh, let's see, we're going to look at Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. Now, the book of Hebrews is interesting. The, um, the author of the book of Hebrews is sort somewhat of a mystery. Personally, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, but I can't prove it. I mean, let's face it, Paul was trained as a rabbi. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, and I've actually read some of Gamaliel's writings. Um, he was a very uh, learned teacher of the Bible. I mean, that guy knew some stuff. And you can still read his, um, his writings. It's in a book uh, called the Talmud. But the Talmud is sort of like... Um, looking for a jewel in a garbage can. That's the best way I can say it. So, all right, let's take a look at Hebrews. All right, let's read Hebrews chap uh, chapter 6. We'll start in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. You ever hear people tell you that repentance is not necessary? Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Now what is a foundation? The foundation of a house is the floor. And you got to lay the floor down before you put the walls on top of the floor. And you got to put the walls up before you put the roof on. So you got to put 
the foundation. The foundation is the floor. That's what supports all the weight of the walls and the roof. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You know, I cringe when people say that repentance is, is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's it. Repentance is optional. I mean, Hebrews 1, I mean, what can I tell you? Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Listen carefully. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. And what is... We're going to get back to enlightened. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. All right, so, for it is impossible to those who were once enlightened. What does enlightened mean? It's from uh, the Greek, Strong's Greek, 5461 and 5457. It means to illuminate or to make manifest. To make manifest, um, if you had a manifest on a ship, it's something that declares what the contents of the ship are. In other words, you're telling people what you have. That's, and to illuminate is a Latin word that means to bring forth light. And that is where they get the word for Lucifer. It means light bearer. So when you get mor morons like James White that says, well, you know, Lucifer doesn't belong in the Bible because it's a Latin word. Well, duh, 20% of the English language comes from the Latin so let's get rid of all the Latin words, right? And taco, taco Spanish. So let's get rid of taco. You can't use taco because it's a Spanish word. It doesn't belong in English, right? Oh, and burrito, right? That's the kind of idiots. But Lucifer, illuminate, enlighten, you know, that's what that means. Taste it. For it, is, it, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift. Tasted. That's from the Greek 1089. It means experienced. Okay? Partakers. Uh, let's see. 3358, 3348. It means to share, participate, or belong to. Mm. And word, 4487305, it means doctrine and commands. So let's, let's, let's take a look at that again. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Hmm. If they shall fall away, what does fall away? It's the Greek, 3995 and 646. It means apostate. Defection. Do you know what it means to defect? It used to be if somebody was a communist in Russia 
and they wanted to defect to the West, it means they would leave their allegiance to Russia and come to America. That's what defect means. So, and it means to defect from the truth, to forsake, to walk away from, okay? So, so, the heavenly gift, the Holy Spirit, the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come in the passage all represent the same thing. That is the doctrine of this word of God, the holy commandments, the truth, the Holy Spirit, and the words, the words of truth. All right, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, let's see. Now, if you've never read the Old Testament, this isn't going to make any sense. But when Moses came down from the mountain, his face shone. It shined just like the sun. And everybody was scared. I mean, they had to put a, he put a veil over his face so that, you know, it's like his face was like a light bulb. And, you know, it scared everybody. So, all right, we're going to read verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Now, when they're talking about the laws of Moses, the commandments, okay? You know, this is the thing with the Hebrew roots people. They think a lot of them, I won't say all of them, but it seems like the majority of them that I've uh, had contact with, that, that I've studied and looked at, think that salvation is in the law. I mean, that is, in a nutshell, what I believe that they believe. I could be wrong. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. You see, when you have faith in Christ, the veil's taken away. You realize the law, the law doesn't save anybody. All the law does is condemn. Shows you that you're a dirty, filthy, rotten sinner. And nobody knows that as well as I do. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, now, uh, verse 17 again, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not bondage. The law is bondage, people. You can't keep the law, period. I don't care what anybody says. All right, 1 John 5 and verse 6. This is he, talking about Jesus, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, in John, the book of John, chapter 16 and verse 13, Jesus was telling the, his disciples what was going to happen after his crucifixion. Uh, let's see. Let's go to verse 12. John 16 and verse 12. 
I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, he, the Holy Spirit is a he, howbeit when he, not like the Jews say the she kinda, no, 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 the Holy Spirit's a he, howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, when the Pentecostals, if, the, uh, if you go to a Pentecostal church and they're glorifying the Holy Spirit, it's not the Holy Spirit, I don't think, my opinion. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify Christ. That's my that's that's how I read this. For he shall receive a mine and shall show it unto you. All right, turn to John chapter 17. Uh, Jesus is getting ready for the crucifixion. John 17 and verse 14, I guess. Jesus speaking. I have given them thy word. Probably talking about the disciples and those that followed him in truth. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Huh? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should, shouldest keep them from the evil? Does that sound like the pre-trib rapture? No. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Hmm. Very interesting. Okay, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. And verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Did you catch that? The soul and the spirit are can be divided. And uh, just a quick note. There's people that'll say, oh, well, you know, there's no such thing as a trinity. Well, yeah, trinity's not in the Bible, but the Bible does teach that man has a soul. The Bible does teach that man has a spirit. And you do have a body. So if you have a body and you can divide the soul and the spirit, well, how many parts is that? Let's see, body one, soul two, spirit three. Man has a body, soul, and spirit. And God made man in his image. So if man's got three parts, how many parts is God? Hmm. Figure that one. Let a Jehovah's Witness chew on that for a while. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That is scary. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Oh yeah. 
All right, let's read that again. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing center of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. So, where else do we read about a two-edged sword? Well, let's see. In um, Revelation one and chapter uh, Revelation chapter one and verse sixteen, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun sun shineth in his strength. Obviously, this is Christ. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Well, obviously, it's not a sword made out of steel. That's, you know, it's the word of God. That's what comes out of his mouth. Revelation 2 and verse 16. Repent. Oh, there's that nasty word again that uh, these, a lot of these famous internet preachers say you don't have to do. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 19.15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fier fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Who is this? Christ. Revelation 19.21, And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Oh, yeah. The sword out of his mouth is the word of God, people. If, just in case you didn't know that, right? All right, let's see what else we got. Now, the, the word, word, in the Strong's is 4487 and 3056. It means doctrine. Or command you know uh, Jesus even said a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another well let's see if we can find that if memory serves me correctly this okay this is in John 13 34 if it serves me correctly this is at the Last Supper now there was a couple times in scriptures uh, they were all the disciples were arguing over who's going to be the greatest of them all. And of course, the Catholics love to tell you, oh, it's Peter. Peter's the greatest of them all. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But this is what Jesus had to say at the Last Supper to the disciples that were arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Don't be arguing and fighting over who's going to be the greatest. Love one another. Now, when you hear people say that uh, Paul is a false apostle and that he changed the law, wrong. It was Jesus who changed the law. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36, Jesus has asked the following question. question. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And if you live next door to a bunch of Satanists and they're your neighbors, I strongly suggest you move. What can I tell you? All right, let's keep going here. So, continuing in the word means to continue in doctrine and command the commandments. And then the word truth means to be true in doctrine, not hiding or not concealing. All right. 
So let's take a look at the unpardonable sin. We're going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Uh, let's take a look. I think I'm going to read this whole chapter. Uh, well, to a point. Let's start in verse uh, Luke, chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, uh, in other words, they're stacked on top of each other. It's like uh, the most crowded concert you'd ever been to in your life. Insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. If you don't know what a Pharisee is, a Pharisee is a Jew. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ears, in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthing? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, listen carefully. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be to be but he that denieth me before men shall be, be, shall be denied before the angels of God. So if people ask you, uh, do you believe in Jesus as, Christ, as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God? And if you confess and say, yes, absolutely, Jesus Christ is Lord. You're confessing him before men. And when the time comes, the Son of Man will confess you positively before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men, if you go, oh, well, I, no, 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 I, I, I want, I'm not one of those Christians because they're, get, they're getting ready to kill you. If they start killing Christians that openly confess Jesus, and you deny Jesus to save your physical life? Read this carefully. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Now that's, that's an important doctrine, people. That's really important. Think about that. Now I think this goes really well with Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse 21. Well, verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And, and didn't we preach on TBN and tell people to send seed money and, and to tithe? and Oh, oh, never mind. That's the Bob uh, translation. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. Iniquity is 
evil and wickedness. I never knew you. That would be the scariest words that a church, a person that attended church all their life could ever hear. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's scary, people. All right, back to Luke 12 and verse 9. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. Verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, that's Christ, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. This is important. And when they bring you into the synagogues, <laughs> did Jesus know the future or what? And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. Oh yeah. So when you're taken to the synagogues or to the judges or whatever, or the government, and they're getting ready to kill you for your faith in Christ, don't think about what you're going to say. Keep your mind blank. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. Now, what is the uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? Uh, Mark chapter 3 explains it fairly well. Uh, let's see, what verse are we going to go to? Verse 22. And the scribes, now the scribes were the, the Jews that copied the Bible. They were the ones that, that made, they were the bookmakers of their days. But they didn't have a printing press, so they had to copy everything by hand. Okay? So the scribes knew, um, they knew, you know, when you write something all the time, you're copying the Bible all the time, I mean, you know it fairly well. They would make scrolls. Okay? And the scribes, which came down from Jerusalem, said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. So they're basically saying that Jesus hath Beelzebub. Uh, which is another name for Satan. And he says, and by the prince of the devils, he casts out devils. Because Jesus had just cast out a devil out of somebody. So they're basically saying, by the power of Satan, he's casting out Satan. And he, Jesus, called unto them and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but half an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. Did you catch that? But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation because they said he hath an unclean spirit. They accused Jesus of being of the devil, of being possessed of Satan. And they do this to this day. Believe it or not, in their uh, in the Jewish Talmud, the Jews to this day 
teach this. Do you ever wonder why you can witness to some Jews and they just can't hear the gospel? Did they blaspheme against the Holy Ghost? Where they will never be forgiven and they're in danger of eternal damnation? I don't know. Would you want to do this sin? And then on the day of judgment, argue with God and say, well, pff, uh, once saved, always saved, Lord. And, and eternal security, you got to let me in. I just don't think it's going to fly. I, you know, that's my opinion. But I'm not the judge. All right, in Matthew 12, we read a parallel parallel account of this in, uh, let's see, verse chapter 12 and verse tw uh, 22. Then was brought unto him one possessed of a devil. Now, if you ask me, it seems like Jesus cast out more devils than uh, any other disease that he healed. I believe that was the number one thing that he did. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees, the Jews, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Wow. All right, and in this, uh, it says the uh, Holy Spirit in these Last passages refers to the doctrine of God. Uh, blasphemy. That comes from Word 988, to speak evil against God. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I don't know about you, but I love the Old Testament. I, I oh, wow. All right, Deuteronomy, uh, chapter thirty-two. We're going to start in verse sixteen. Okay, Deuteronomy thirty-two and verse sixteen. They, we're talking about Israel. They provoked him. God, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. Abhorred means 
hated. But when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. See, faith was important in the Old Testament. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Wow. And they shall be burnt. I'm sorry. And I, uh, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat. And with bitter destruction, I will also send the teeth of bees upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. You know what? You could keep reading this. Oh, it is just wow. Now, there are uh, three or four, I think there's three or four words translated hell. And... The Jehovah's Witnesses, they love to take the first one, where it says grave. Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, or S-H-E-O-U-L, and it means, it usually means grave, but it's, you know, sometimes translated hell. Um, and then in the Greek, there's a word called Gehenna, which was like a burning garbage dump in Jerusalem. And uh, then there was Tartarus, which was the deepest abyss of hell. Uh, let's see, I can't remember them all, but the Jehovah's Witnesses will always take the grave and say, see, that's it, you know, that's it, you know. And they ignore the other words to their own misunderstanding which they always do. Think about these words in 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, let's see. I'm not sure where I'm going to start here. Uh, oh, a word of caution. The uh, people that are generally into the Hebrew roots will tell you that 2 Peter is not a true, doesn't belong in the Bible, they'll tell you. It's a fake, they'll tell you. Because Second Peter acknowledges that Paul was a brother in Christ, and they can't have that, generally. Um, almost, almost all the Hebrew roots people that I know will deny Paul as an apostle. So, all right, Second Peter 2, chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, and starting in verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity they allure through the lusts of the flesh lusts of the flesh through much wantonness those that were clean escaped from them who live in error while they promise them liberty yeah there are people that will teach that you can live and sin all you want because we have liberty I think that's what this is talking about while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they had known it to turn to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them 
who, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had know it, they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow, the pig, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You could take a pig out of the mud and wash it, and as soon as you let it go, it runs right back to the mud, the filth of this world. Now, if you ask me, those that know, to me, when I read this, it, it scares me that those that knew the way of the Lord and then they returned back to the world. I, I don't know. It scares me um, to, to tell people that, you know, all you got to do is say a sinner's prayer and, and you can't go to hell no matter how you live. I read this. This this is this is scary, people. All right, Luke chapter twelve, verse forty-five. But and if that servant say in his heart, "My lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken." So here it is. This is a servant of the Lord. And he says, well, eh, Jesus isn't coming back anytime soon. And instead of showing mercy, he beats the men servants and the women. And he's eating and drinking and he's drunk. Okay. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Did you catch that? And will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Here it is, a servant of the Lord, and he's going to be given a portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, Neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Uh, when you take a whip and you hit somebody on their back, it leaves a stripe. It leaves a mark. You know, like a stripe, a leopard. What is it? Oh, not a leopard. I don't know. Something's got... A tiger has stripes. Okay. But he... So... The servant that knows what to do and doesn't do it, he's going to get beaten bad. Verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes. So if you're ignorant and you're doing things that are wrong, but you didn't know. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. But, who, but unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they shall ask the more. People, this is what scares me the most. I, you know, I've studied the Bible for thousands of hours, and it scares me some of the stuff that I know. Because that's a thing. Every word that comes out of my mouth, I'm going to have to give an account one day. And you don't hear me asking for money and donations. And Jesus said, next, verse 49, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. Oh, yeah. Jesus didn't come to bring peace on earth. You hear that stupid Christmas carol, you know, uh, joy to the world, peace on earth, and all that kind of junk. That's what it is. 
junk. I could use a stronger word, but it would be Christian. All right, let's keep going. Now, this person always also writes, these last passages indicate a harsher judgment for those who once had the Holy Spirit. Also see Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15, Luke 10, and verses 10 through 16. Worse punishment, more tolerable for Sodom. You know, and that's a thing. Um, think about it. The Jews were watching all the miracles that Jesus was doing and the things that he was teaching. And they didn't repent. They knew the word of God. They knew the word of God. But they didn't repent. They didn't believe Jesus. All the things that he did, they didn't believe him. You know, Sodom didn't see the... Sodom probably didn't know the word of God. Sodom didn't see the miracles. If they did, Jesus even said that uh, if, if Sodom had seen these miracles, they would have repented. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Okay, Matthew 11... I'm sorry. Um, Matthew 11, 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. See, Capernaum didn't listen to Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty four. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Ooh. Mark 6, 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony, testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Get the idea? Get the picture? All right. Oh, let's paraphrase a little bit here. Matthew 12 and verse 37. By thy words... You'll be justified, and by thy words you'll be condemned. Matthew 10, 33. Whosoever denies me before men, him I'll also deny before my Father in heaven. Luke 12, 19. He who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. 2 Timothy 2, 12. If we deny him, Jesus, if we deny him, he also will deny us. Very important. Wow. This one's note says, Blasphemous words against the Holy Spirit is the worst kind of sin and unpardonable. Mercy will be extended even to blasphemy against God's name and honor. Even, even words against Christ will be forgiven. The only Unforgivable sin is a spoken sin. It is speaking against the Holy Spirit. This is such a grievous infidelity that it's unpardonable because repentance is hidden from the sinner's eyes. God sends powerful delusion to those who commit this sin. That, this is an incredible, um, so, this is incredible what this person sent to me. I don't want to say who it is, um, I'm going to forward this uh, to them. And like I said, they asked me, how does predestination mess, mesh with this? Um, this is somebody that I was uh, talking to about the Bible a number of years ago. And uh, wow, this is incredible. I I am really, I'm really, uh, Glad to see they're asking such questions. Well, this is going to be part one, because it's almost already been an hour. So, uh, let's see. This is, uh, what is this? Eternal security versus unpardonable sin. Falling away apostasy, part one. All right. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. Um, happy Sabbath day.
In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.